to get to know her. Uh, Tashika was born in uh, Papikio, Hawaii. Her parents were immigrants from Okinawa who arrived in Hawaii to work in the fields. It was primarily uh, sugar plantations when she grew up. She was one of uh, six of 11 children, so large family. And I remember Toshiko telling me, even though she was in the middle of the pack, uh, that she loved to boss everybody around. So I got a sense from an early age, she had a very strong will and was very determined. And that determination throughout her life uh, made for a very successful career. Uh, she said that any influence that came from her culture, uh, being Japanese American, uh, was uh, influenced by culture in, in general, not necessarily specifically Japanese ceramics, although it did reinforce her inclinations. Uh, one can't help but associate her brief discussions about her work with the Japanese belief that the most profound thing cannot be spoken. It's important not to exoticize her work. She should be recognized as an individual and original creator, the product of varied influences and her own distinctive ideas. Uh, after uh, she graduated high school, uh, she uh, started making pottery at the Hawaii Potters Guild. This is in 1940. You have to remember she was uh, in Honolulu. A year later was Pearl Harbor. And although her family was uh, Japanese American, uh, fortunately they weren't interned, although the war did have a profound effect on the family. And it was during this time, shortly thereafter, she worked at a small ceramic production company. And that's where she met Claude Haran, uh, who ended up teaching at the University of Hawaii from 1947 to 1978. And Claude was a very important uh, first teacher of Tashikos that she recognized throughout her life. Uh, so after she met uh, Claude, she attended uh, the University of Hawaii uh, for three years where she learned more technical aspects of uh, being a studio potter, uh, materials, firing kilns, and trying to develop her own voice uh, through her visual vocabulary. Uh, after her studies in Hawaii, uh, she went to graduate school at uh, Cranbrook, Cranbrook Academy in Michigan. And this was perhaps her most profound educational experience that impacted her, her uh, throughout her life. Uh, at the time, the ceramic uh, instructor was Maya Grotel, who herself was a Finnish immigrant. And it's interesting that Cranbrook uh, is sort of modeled after a European atelier. So while there were certainly uh, classes and specific curriculum, uh, there was an open studio environment. So Toshiko had the opportunity to work uh, side by side uh, with Gretel. And Gretel was a, a fierce worker. She worked day and night. And I think that instilled in uh, Toshiko her incredible work ethic throughout the years. Um, also at Cranbrook uh, is when Toshiko started uh, experimenting with weaving. She worked on the loom, uh, another Finnish immigrant, uh, Marianne Strengel uh, was the weaving instructor. Uh, so those, those formative years at Cranbrook really sort of set the stage for Toshiko as far as uh, having strong role models, uh, powerful women that were artist educators. Uh, it was extremely important for her. Uh, as a teacher, Gretel offered each student a way into creativity and an individual standard of excellence. With great care for individual rhythms of each person, she used silence, humor, disarming ambiguity, and occasionally 
powerfully focused, perfectly timed uh, remarks delivered in a centered, resonant voice. And when I read that about Gretel, I, I think the same sort of philosophy and approach to students uh, carried on with the Chico when she went on uh, for teaching. Uh, Toshiko mentioned that uh, speaking about Gretel is she felt like she could read my mind. She knew me so well. The most important lesson Grotel was to find your own voice. Uh, they ended up becoming lifelong friends as well as Jack Leonard Larson, a well-known textile designer uh, who had graduated from Cranbrook uh, in a previous year. So it was her studies with Gretel uh, that she realized that every artist had to develop and find their own individual voice. It's a philosophy that continued to play an important role in the way she approached her own teaching uh, with her students. <clears throat> After graduating, uh, she taught for a couple of years at the University of Wisconsin. She replaced a uh, sabbatical replacement with uh, Harvey Littleton, the well-known glass uh, maker. And from there, she taught for almost 10 years at the Cleveland Institute, which had a rich history in ceramic design, craft design, and was surrounded by influential colleagues, uh, the ceramicist Claude Con Conover, uh, Victor Schreckengost, and Lisa McVeigh. Uh, after teaching, uh, she took an eight month trip with her family, uh, her mother and sister uh, to Japan. She felt like she needed to uh, have a direct connection uh, to her heritage. And even though uh, her parents were Okinawan, which is part of Japan, Okinawans had their own specific cultural identity as well. Uh, they spent time uh, visiting shrines, uh, they spent time studying in a Zen Buddhist monastery, and they also visited uh, some of the more important potters in Japan at that time, uh, Toyo Kanashige, uh, the Zen potter, uh, Kirio Rozanjin, uh, known for grabbing influences uh, from all over Japan. He was a restaurateur, uh, and she also met Soji Hamada and Suetsu Yanagi, the philosopher. Uh, who uh, were the main promulgators of Minge uh, folk pottery. And although she had a high admiration uh, for Hamada and Yanagi, uh, sort of the Minge influence and uh, philosophies didn't really resonate with Toshiko. Uh, she saw herself more aligned with the avant-garde uh, artists uh, in Japan from the Sudeshi uh, clay movement that uh, started after World War II. Uh, she went on to uh, settle in Clinton, New Jersey in a semi-rural area, purchased an old movie theater, set up a home and studio, uh, and then uh, later moved to uh, her present home in uh, Quakertown. Uh, she started teaching in uh, 1967, which lasted through 1992 at Princeton University. And like Rattel, she was firm and expected serious concentration from her students. So the, uh, she started the visual arts program at uh, Princeton and then there weren't any art majors per se uh, but students were expected to take the liberal arts class uh, sort of to round out their education. Uh, two of her more well-known students are Brooke Shields, the actress, and Queen Noor from uh, Jordan. And I still have a hard time wrapping my head seeing Brooke Shields throw on a potter's wheel, but that she did. Uh, you know, if, if, if her students showed some promise and took what she was saying seriously, uh, she uh, devoted more time to help that person along. Uh, 
She didn't try to be popular. Again, uh, I found this when I met Toshiko. You know, if you didn't know her, she came across as a pretty serious person. Uh, was short on words. She wasn't chatty or talkative per se. Uh, but once you got to know her, she had a very sly wit and had a great sense of humor. Uh, those students that took her classes seriously, became lifelong friends and devotees of her. So it was at this time too that, uh, I mean, throughout her career earlier on, she was uh, showing a national exhibition. She was at the ceramics, uh, participated in the ceramics national for many years at Syracuse University and other uh, juried exhibitions. Uh, she was in great demand uh, for leading workshops. Uh, as far as gallery representation, probably the two most important galleries in her latter career was Perimeter Gallery in Chicago. Uh, that was co-owned by Frank Palich and uh, Karen Johnson Boyd. Uh, that relationship started in the late 80s. And then in 1992, started showing at Charles Cole's gallery. Uh, in New York City, uh, where Peter Volkus uh, was showing as well. And really at that time, there weren't that many uh, fine art galleries uh, showing uh, ceramics at the time. That has since changed, uh, but you have to remember the time and place in which uh, Toshiko's career took place. <clears throat> So in 2009, I got a call from Evelyn Krosnick, who's pictured on the left. Evelyn lived in Princeton, was a big uh, fan and supporter and friend of Toshiko's, uh, who moved to Scottsdale in uh, 2006. Uh, and like Toshiko, she was very straightforward and firm. She called me up one day when I was at the Ceramic Center and said, you must come to Toshiko Takezu's house. She wants to give the museum work, uh, some of her work. And it was this period in Toshiko's life where she was gifting museums uh, works from her collection as long as they already had one piece of hers that for her demonstrated a commitment to her work. <clears throat> so, you know, I was probably busy and I said, oh, that's great, Evelyn, I'd like to, but, you know, uh, let me see what my schedule looks like next month. And I said, no, you must come now. So I think about two weeks later, later I scheduled a trip to Princeton, and that's uh, where I first started engaging uh, with Toshiko in a meaningful way. Uh, Evelyn and her husband, Arthur, were the, the largest collectors of George Nakashima's work. The image on the left is uh, their living room in Princeton. Uh, the only other person that had more Nakashima work was Nelson Rockefeller. So prior to leaving, uh, to move to Arizona, they had a big auction at Sotheby's and sold, I think it was 120 works of Nakashima's. But I, I need to credit the Krosniks for the introduction to Toshiko. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, Toshiko, uh, you know, it was the last uh, eight years or so of her life where she spent quite a bit of time contacting museums around the country and curators, uh, you know, asking them if they wanted uh, a grouping of her works. Uh, so when I went there, she already had this group of work laid out in front of her studio. And I spent time looking at it and I said, you know, this is really fabulous to Chico, but, you know, can we walk around the studio and house and see what else she might have? And I think this took her by surprise because a lot of the curators and uh, museum directors that had come really didn't have uh, a knowledge base of ceramics or studio craft, or for that matter, maybe wasn't, weren't that familiar with Toshiko's uh, career herself. 
So I think I made a positive impression that sort of cemented our relationship. And as we walked around the house, uh, I mentioned, said, well, Tashiko, that group you have for ASU doesn't have any other Makaha Blue. This is, you know, that's something we would do. And then I walked around and saw some other groups set aside, and there was a group of eight or spots, half of them with the Makaha Blue Glues. And how about, you know, we sort of switched things around a little bit. She laughed, and we pushed and we made it happen. But the great joys uh, with these visits ended up going to Chico's home uh, for different occasions was, uh, uh, you know, the incredible environment uh, she built for herself that reflected all of her interests uh, besides pottery making uh, and art in general was her uh, garden. It was really a life that was fully integrated. Uh, and that's a lot of uh, that's what a lot of our artists aspire to that integration between life and art, where there's very little. Uh, these are just uh, shots of her studio. One of the in images aren't coming up for some reason, but Tashika was a workhorse. Uh, she worked all the time, day and night, uh, when she wasn't gardening or doing yoga. Also very added to the apprentice uh, system. Uh, she always had one or two apprentices working with. Her. Uh, so throughout her career, uh, Tashiko never abandoned uh, functional pottery. Still continued uh, to make bowl plates and cups. Uh, her apprentices assisted her with all the facets of running a studio, mixing glazes, wedging clay, and firing kilns. And uh, there's a few apprentices listening uh, now that have a lot, a lot of personal stories about Tashiko that they cherish. So uh, besides her uh, ceramic work, known I just wanted to show a few examples with some of her paintings uh, I think the one on the right is corrupted for some reason and uh, people read these as landscapes and certainly uh, to drew sort of emotions and the colorations of Hawaii into these paintings uh, but she was always pretty adamant that these weren't meant to be landscapes or read necessarily as landscapes. Uh, they were more abstracted, uh, evocative moods uh, that the viewer could interpret uh, how they choose. Uh, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> she studied uh, weaving when she was at Cranbrook and throughout uh, part of her career made these beautiful uh, rugs, mostly rye rugs made of wool, uh, silk, uh, cotton fibers, and they certainly uh, have a strong link to her ceramic work, her coloration, her design sensibilities. Uh, and uh, another person that was influential uh, in Tashiko's life was the weaver Lenore Tani. Uh, who was uh, a pioneering uh, fiber artist uh, starting in the 1950s and ended up living with Tashiko, uh, I think in the late 70s for about three or four years. Uh, they also traveled uh, to Mexico and Guatemala uh, visiting indigenous weavers in those countries. And Tashiko also uh, worked in bronze Mary Beth will talk more about uh, the bronzes, but she really didn't see any separation uh, between her work in clay, uh, fiber, and bronze. Uh, there was always close affinities. You know, certainly bronze material gave uh, more permanence to her work. Uh, she was able to use different techniques. Uh, 
but Toshiko always loved uh, uh, the, the state of uh, sounds. And I think maybe the bells possibly came from her uh, visits to Japan, to Shinto shrines and uh, different places in Japan where she would have been exposed to uh, the chiming of bells. <clears throat> so, uh, Toshiko retired in 1992 from Princeton. Uh, she was approaching 70 years old and she had a sense that she really wanted to do something big, uh, uh, increase her scale. You know, prior to that, her works were either the small hand held uh, closed forms or slightly larger, three feet but she commenced on a series called the Star Series, which were named after uh, uh, mythological stars and constellations. Uh, these are approximately six feet in height. And really, you know, when she increased her scale and the surface that she was able to paint on, I think it really changed the way she uh, moved around the pieces, how she constructed the pieces. Uh, and it really uh, provided a, a sense of major accomplishment for her. And this whole series now resides at the Racine Art Museum uh, in Wisconsin. So in a video I watched when she was making this series before it was closed, uh, Toshiko always put little uh, daubs of clay in her smaller work so they would rattle. But in some of these larger works, she wrote words and the uh, interviewer asked her, uh, well, what did you write? And she said, that's for me to know. And if you know Toshiko, that sort of straightforward, no nonsense answer, uh, bears a lot of truth to uh, Toshiko's character. <clears throat> Another interesting aspect, I think, of Toshiko's work is uh, uh, through her latter career, uh, not seeing her ceramics as single objects to be set on a pedestal, but placed in uh, installation formats. So on the left, you see Gaia, uh, Mother Earth, her uh, moon uh, balls. Uh, that she made that were generally placed in the guard uh, in her yard or on the floor in galleries. Uh, but as she was drying them, uh, she wanted to eat, uh, them to dr dry evenly. Uh, and she happened to have a hammock and her apprentice said, why don't you put those in the hammock and that way the air will come underneath it. <clears throat> and she really loved the way uh, the work presented itself in that uh, different light. Uh, so it's uh, there were several variations of uh, the Gaia, and on the right the uh, homage to devastation forest, tree man forest. Uh, she made these in both ceramic and bronze, and they were influenced uh, in part by uh, trees that were burned during uh, volcanic eruptions uh, in Hawaii. She went back to visit every year. Uh, so the contrast of the black lava, the charred trees, maybe the white sand, uh, was where the genesis of this uh, work came about. I put uh, this piece in. Uh, Toshiko uh, worked on several other forms. I mentioned, uh, you know, there's the closed forms of varying height. Uh, the moon balls. Uh, she also did a small series of hearts. I just happen to love these. They seem to be a little more literal uh, than some of her other works. Uh, there's still a, a sense of abstraction, but clearly uh, her calligraphic heart echoes uh, the form of this piece. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so after the uh, sort of negotiations with the gift uh, of works to ASU, we received 18 pieces of Tachikos. Uh, three former students of Tachikos, uh, Don Fletcher, uh, John Mosler, and uh, Bill Baumbach approached me. They had formed a separate foundation called the TT uh, Book Foundation. And I think, uh, you know, there was numerous uh, museum catalogs of Tashikos over the years. Uh, there was uh, a photographic book of Tashiko, but I think she really wanted something that was more comprehensive of uh, the totality of her career. Uh, so as I affectionately call them, the Princeton boys uh, contacted me about uh, being project manager and editor uh, for the book. Uh, and this was getting on to the last couple of years of Tashiko's life. When I first met her, uh, you know, she was slowing down physically, but mentally very sharp. <clears throat> um, but, you know, uh, being in her late 80s, her health was starting to decline. And uh, the goal of this book was twofold. One is to document her life as completely as possible uh, for the greater world. Uh, the second goal was to make sure the book got completed and put into Shiko's hands before she passed away. Uh, so when all the manuscripts and the photography were completed, we had four months to uh, put the book to press. And I'm very happy and pleased to say we got the book into Shiko's hands three days before her passing, which was really a gift. I'm gonna end up by just talking about uh, uh, you know, activities uh, uh, with Dashiko's work uh, after her passing. And uh, I'm sure Don will talk more about it. <clears throat> but there's been a trend in museums, I'd say in the last decade, uh, that seems to be accelerating of not looking at uh, museum holdings uh, so uh, separated and removed from uh, media, but really looking at uh, the time and place uh, the works were made. And, uh, you know, Tashiko's work always had an abstract quality to their surfaces, very calligraphic. <coughs> uh, so this is uh, an exhibition at the MFA Boston, I believe. Uh, still might be going on now. Uh, but they paired uh, Tashiko's work in the collection with the painting of uh, Joan Mitchell. So, uh, you know, I think uh, this concept of mixing collections and not uh, looking at craft objects in a secondary light, uh, that they have as much potency and meaning as other uh, aspects of the fine arts uh, is starting to be realized more fully. Uh, this is another installation from 2016 at uh, the Yale's uh, Art Gallery. Uh, this time, uh, Tashiko's moon balls are paired with a uh, painting of Marth Rothko on the left and uh, Robert Rauschenberg uh, painting to the right. Um, you know, I think this is something that Tashiko would think is uh, honorific, that it was long overdue, that she always considered herself a sculptor in clay, uh, although she started out as a functional potter. Uh, and I think too that, uh, you know, as critics and curators and art historians sort of revisit uh, Eurocentric uh, canon. Uh, they're looking into people, artists like Tashiko and others, uh, in a different light. And uh, I just want to read you a short passage from uh, 
Ezra Shales, who uh, curated a show called Oh Pioneers that highlighted a lot of uh, women artists in the craft field uh, from the 50s on. He said, looking back at Objects USA, which was an important uh, exhibition uh, in 1969, it seems unbelievable that she was treated as the other. She was always called Hawaiian Japanese in her imagery, as Zen in her soulfulness, as feminine. Uh, earlier on, the Los Angeles Time ran a file of Tishiko calling her the Japanese potter. And uh, again, going back to Objects USA, uh, they characterize uh, her work as well as Karen Carnes is uh, delicate, where uh, the male artists represented in that show weren't characterized in the same manner. Um, so her mother once told her that uh, don't depend on your background, uh, develop your own, uh, that you have to look inside. And this is something uh, Toshiko carried with her throughout her career. She was certainly proud of her heritage, uh, uh, but she always wanted it to be seen as an individual voice uh, in the studio, ceramic movement. And I think the legacy of her work proves that uh, she was indeed uh, here in a field, make vision, uh, had the necessary skills to complete uh, ambitious work and uh, was dedicated to teaching students. Um, just have a lot of respect for her. She was really a fabulous person. And with that, I'll pass the baton to Beth. Peter, can you un, um, unshare? Uh, let's see. Down um, at the bottom, that, I think it's the green folder again. Yeah, my whole screen disappeared. So oh. I'm trying to get back to where I was. Do you have an escape button? You're probably in the full screen mode. Sorry. If you have an escape button in yeah. the top left corner, that'll take yeah, you hit out that. of the full screen. There we go. Are we good? Yes, thanks. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the process of how I came about deciding to do a Toshiko Takeizo show, as well as some traveling that I did um, in December, and um, some of the permanent collection that we will be installing for the show. So I have been curating shows strictly from the permanent collection. And about a year ago, I did a show called Clay, Clay Blazers, Women of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I was pulling checklists from each artist to see which objects I wanted to use for the exhibition itself. And when I came to Chico's objects, I had no idea that we had 37 objects in our collection. We have about maybe 10 of her works that are in open storage on display for everyone to see. There was a handful in 3D storage, and then we also had about 18 that were in off-site storage. So I really wanted to have a solo show of her work as well as get all of the works out because, um, Peter, correct me, but I think um, a lot of the pieces have never been out on view. So that's one thing that I wanted to do. 
So the um, title of the show is called Look to Nature, Toshiko Takiezu. And I would like to start with a few questions. Some of these questions, you might have responses to these questions a little bit different now that we are in the stay at home mode, or maybe the responses to these questions are a lot clearer now that you have time to reflect on things. So what makes you feel connected? What experiences have helped you to understand who you are? What passions do you have that you could not live without? For artist Toshiko Takiezu, the answers to these questions above lied in the interconnectedness of her life and her art. She said, in my life, I see no difference between making pots, cooking, and growing gardens. They are all so related. However, there is a need for me to work in clay. It is so gratifying and I get so much joy from it. And it gives, gives me many answers in my life. Takiezu attributed her artistic growth to her teachers. She later passed on the passion to her own students. Through teaching at the Cleveland Institute of Art and Princeton University and by training live in apprentices. She gave a new generation of artists the opportunity to find themselves through ceramics. Best known as a potter who taught the, at Princeton for 25 years, Takiezu was at the forefront of a movement that turned ceramics from craft into an art form. So I had the opportunity in December to meet with Carrie Liu, who is the Nancy and Peter Lee curator of Asian art at Princeton University. And he was able to give me a behind the scenes tour of all of their uh, Takiezu objects that were in their collection in back storage. So I wanna share the experience with you so that you can see um, how things are stored and how we as a museum care for our objects when they're in storage by mounting and stabilizing them to take all precautions necessary to preserve the condition of the objects. So Dana, you'll be excited about these photos. So this is back storage and this is how um, they have everything stabilized when not in use. So in the exhibition, Look to Nature, we highlight pieces by Takiezu drawn entirely from the museum's permanent collection that explore how her artistic process and love for nature helped shape and expand her understandings of herself and the world. It maps her rich career and interest in diverse media and nature. The exhibition also encourages the audience to take inspiration from Takiezu and question how our own life experience, lived experience and passions shape us all. So I just picked a handful of pieces that are in our collection that will be on display, but I didn't wanna show everything because then there's no surprises. So there's um, platters, a vase, and then we have um, the uh, moon pots, So we have about four bowls, plates and platters, tea bowl, and then 30 closed form vessels that will be installed in the exhibition. So Takiyasu's interest in creative potential of fiber started at Cranbrook uh, Academy, where she studied weaving with Strangle. She was drawn to the texture of fiber and richness, richness of color deep blues, purples, browns, and blacks. The color palette that she developed in these weavings would later inform her striking abstract expressionist and color field glazing of her clay works. And so I am very excited uh, that I will have a weaving in the show. I was um, lucky to have a uh, private collector allow me to borrow it for the show. So I, again, am not showing the picture because it's going to be a surprise when the exhibition is installed. So 
another wonderful experience that I had was um, visiting for two days at the Takeyasu studio. As you can see, um, I definitely visited uh, different months than Peter did because there's icicles everywhere. But Don and Carla were very welcoming and I had a wonderful stay. I was able to see her studio, her, the home, and I was able to delve in the archives um, from her, from the foundation and um, scanned original photos, uh, looked at letters. Um, one, of, one of the things that um, I always try to incorporate into exhibitions is using our archives that we have at the Ceramics Research Center. It really brings in um, a different experience because I think that you're able to see original correspondence or photos uh, see videos of the artist. Um, we have audio interviews that you can listen to the voice of the artist. So I always try to pull things. Um, from the left is some of the um, letters that I went through when I was at her studio. Um, to the right, the upper right, is uh, a still shot of a 16 millimeter film that I found in the Susan Peterson archive collection that I had digitized. It's two minutes long, but it's showing Takiezu actually the process of glazing on flat pieces as well as her closed form. So that will also be installed in the show. So I just wanna take a moment to talk again about the archives because it's something that I really um, want to try to get out there and have people aware of what we have because it is such a gem. Um, we have the, um, the archives um, often support the museum's collection and exhibitions so that students, collectors, and museum curators and scholars may study historical records associated with artworks we collect and show. These archives house the expansive personal collection, books, photographs, notes, pottery of re renowned artist, writer, educator, Susan Peterson. We also have um, the Studio Potter archive as well, which has over 700 audio um, interviews that Jerry Williams did, and we have digitized them recently, so they are available as an MP3. So we have an extensive amount of knowledge that's at the Ceramics Research Center, and we do have researchers and uh, curators come from all over to use them um, throughout the year. So Takeyezu found that the sense the senses of sight, touch, and hearing were closely connected. While she focused on visual aesthetics, she often incorporated sound into her work. As Peter mentioned earlier, she placed clay beads in some of her clothes pots, which rattled uh, when handled. She even created several bronze bells. So uh, a big part of all exhibitions is the educational programming. And one of the things that my academic intern, uh, Sam Stoss, is going to do is recreate some of these rattles so that when um, you're in the space, we have um, a workshop and people can actually handle these reproduced rattles to hear the sound and experience um, just different sounds from you know how many beads that might be placed in the rattles. So that will be available for people to engage in. In the last decades of her career, Takiezu created a series of sculptural works in bronze at the, in, in New Jersey. Using the lost wax process, many of her bronze forms were extensions of her work in clay, trees, moons, and sculptural forms. Working in bronze enabled her to create forms that, were, that went beyond the structural properties of clay. During this period, Takiezu created a series of bronze bells by Japanese temple bells. Like those ancient precedents, Takiezu's bells have no clappers. Instead, the bells are struck with a wooden mallet. The surface treatments of these bells reflect a wide range of patinas, colors, and textures. So this also interests me because I was trying to figure out how I wanted to incorporate the sounds of these bells in the actual space of the exhibition. So again, when I was at um, the Takiezu studio, I was able to 
uh, record the, the bell and um, in the very cold weather, Don was uh, very gracious and did not grumble. And he stood out there until I had the recordings that I needed of the bells that were at the studio. I also went to um, Cedar Crest College, which is in Pennsylvania. And this is a bell that was made to honor the, um, the uh, president of the, the President Planey, sorry. It was um, a bell, it was the first bell that Toshiko actually named and the name of the bell is the Dorothy Bell. These are more bells that were at the Toshiko studio. So all the bells that I did visit, I did record. And you can see here all the icicles. And then this is um, the bell that's at Princeton University. And this is known as the Remembrance Bell. Um, this was done um, in, to, com to commemorate the 13 alumni who died in the attacks of September 11th, 2001. So I'm going to um, just play a recording of the bell. Um, and before I introduce, um, before I introduce Don Fletcher, and I really look forward to being back in the space at the Ceramics Research Center and having the privilege to walk you all through the exhibition. Uh, make sure that you follow us on social media platforms or check the museum's website to stay up to date with the opening of the museum and all our exhibitions and programs. So, here is the sound of the remembrance bell. All right, thank you. Don, are you here? I don't see. No, I don't see, I don't see a Don. Um, okay. I know that he uh, work is really crazy with everything that's going on. So, um, but he thought that he might be able to join in. Mary Beth, can you try and play the bell again? Um, I think you need to not share your PowerPoint. Oh, just, sure. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have to find it, hold on. No worries. Oh, I think I had to pull it up again. So while we're waiting for me to pull this up, um, there, I, I am going to have some sort of sound in the exhibition space and also working with education, Kat and Kevin, we are gonna come up with some sort of um, interactive sound in the uh, workshop area too, using all the recordings, so. Oh, sorry, I got rid of it. No worries. Maybe you can um, find it and then share it in the chat, a link in the chat so everyone can click on it. Sure. Once you find it. Yep, sounds so good. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. So if you want to unmute yourself, Mary Beth, I'm going to stop sharing your screen if that's okay. Oh, I thought we already so we did. Can, yes, thank you. So we can all just see each other. <laughs> So if there are any questions, now's your time to unmute, ask away, or again, you can share them in the chat.
I don't have a question. I just have to run to class. So I wanted to say it was lovely to see your faces. You too. <laughs> I miss, I miss you. you. I know. I, I love you. you. Okay, I love Good you too. To see you too. Uh, and be well, everybody. You too. I have a question uh, for Peter, actually. Um, there's a lot of talk about her gardening, but can we touch a little closer on how she incorporated the, her love of gardening into her work? So like, can we connect those dots for her love of gardening into how it corresponded and correlated into her work? Uh, so one example, I showed an image of it uh, with a bunch of, uh, with some other images of, uh, <clears throat> Uh, earlier work, but she did this uh, form called uh, tamarind. Uh, it's uh, like three stacked bulbous forms put together. And that was uh, sort of a direct influence of uh, being inspired by the tamarind seed. Uh, I think, you know, with a lot of Toshiko's work, you can't really connect dots to dots as closely. Um, you know, she talked about, you know, changing seasons, uh, the sound the forest makes, uh, you know, maybe a, a squash blossom in that garden. Maybe she liked the color and decided to use more yellow glaze that day. So it's really hard to say, uh, you know, like A, B, and C piece are, you know, rooted in the garden, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Because she talks about cooking also. So I was just wondering if, because of her use of like Zen, if there are any connections between Zen and gardening and cooking for all of her work as all. Well. I think the Zen part is just a interconnectedness of all those activities, uh, cooking, gardening, working, doing yoga, uh, interacting with students. Uh, you know, it, it's hard because, uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, Toshiko at times was short on words or she told you in a semi-polite way to figure it out on your own. <laughs> so uh, she really wasn't articulate about or didn't even try to articulate uh, what a piece meant or, you know, why this calligraphic mark on this pot had certain significance or why in a weaving there was that white circle. Uh, she pretty much left that up to the viewer to bring their own experience and thoughts uh, to the work. I was talking to one of the apprentices and I asked a question about um, her practice in Buddhism and her response was pretty, pretty neat. It was, um, she had a Buddhist flavor. So she just said that, you know, Toshiko was always grounded no matter what she did and she just flowed. And um, it showed in the way she gardened. Like she, I read something about um, like, if you're gonna go out and pull weeds and you're not really thinking about it, then you're missing the process. So I think that she was just always, um, clear-minded and just flowed with everything that she did, whether it was her um, her glazing or her making or the gardening and even cooking. And when I was at um, the house, Don, I asked Don, um, first of all, does she have any recipes? And he, he said she never used recipes. And then he also said that she was always surprised when she met an artist who didn't like to cook. She just thought that they always went hand in hand, so. It's one o'clock just for those who, I don't know, have somewhere to be. <laughs> I know that's probably not true, but we are at one o'clock and we do have a question in the chat from Jeffrey. It's for you, Peter. It says, are you familiar with any direct interactions with Rothko or others like Motherwell, Klein, Mitchell, et cetera? <clears throat> You know, not that I know of, uh, not in the early years. I've never seen anything that had direct interactions with those artists. Uh, you know, I know in talking with her, one of the 
reasons moving uh, to New Jersey. Where she lived was only about 45 minutes from Manhattan. <clears throat> Is that she, you know, did like to go into the city maybe once every two months to see a particular show. And so she certainly was aware of all those artists. Uh, and, uh, but I've never heard of her uh, having, I know she interacted with George O'Keefe uh, she visited her studio in Abiquiu in New Mexico. Uh, she met and interacted with uh, Izumu Noguchi several times, uh, but none of the Abex painters that I'm aware of. I mean, that's something that might be in the archive, but I've, you know, through readings, archives, uh, videos, she's never mentioned that direct connection. Thank you. And Mary Beth, um, I'm going to have this be our last question. If there are any other burning questions, it's from Carly. And she said, do you have any ideas about how you will use the sounds? I do know how I'm going to use the sounds in the exhibition space, but I'm not telling anyone. You have to wait. <laughs> and um, as far as the sounds in education, I think both Kat and Kevin and I are still trying to figure out how that's going to look, but I want it to be where, I want it to be just as interactive as the rattles for people to just, um, just engage in the different sounds and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yes, you'll have to, you'll have to go to the exhibition once we are open again. All right. And with that plug, I hope to see everybody soon in our physical space. Um, I hope everyone is staying healthy, happy, sane. <laughs> um, and thank you for joining us. So we yes, will see you, you guys Thanks. next month, third Tuesday, third Thursday. So with that, thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Everyone Peter. Have a good day. Thanks for your help. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.